We're going to get into Ezra today. If you're new, we typically go through books of the Bible. We, we take about 12 times a year. We'll do some topicals here and there as maybe there's maybe there are some current events. Maybe there's some things the Holy Spirit's just leading your elders and pastor to speak to. But we've been moving through the book of Ezra and we try to go back and forth between Old Testament and New Testament. And so we're going to get, in, get into chapter 7 today. I know some of you like to have your Bibles open. We'll, when we read it, we will have it on the screen. There's also Bibles in the seats in front of you if you want to grab one and follow along there. Uh, but before we do, I, I do have an excursus which won't make sense at, at the outset. But as I was preparing the sermon, I also had other things going on this week and weekend. And Catherine and I went to see... A movie this weekend. Uh, some of you may have seen it or may have seen the trailer laughed, but uh, we went and saw Hobbs and Shaw. Now, that of course is starring Dwayne Johnson, or as some of you know him, The Rock, and Jason Statham, or as some of you know him, The Transporter. Uh, but technically, in these roles, they're part of the Fast and Furious franchise, which at this point has eight movies. Number nine is on the way. Uh, they were not a part of the original parts of this series. In fact, episode five introduced us to Luke Hobbs and, and The Rock's or Dwayne Johnson's character. And then of course, as we got into episode seven, it introduced us to Deckard Shaw or Jason Statham's character. And so now after eight movies, they have their own spin-off movie where we find out more about their past, more about their family, etc., etc. What it does is it fleshes out their portion of the story. In fact, somebody asked me, they're like, well, do I need to watch all eight Fast and the Furious movies? And they had that look of, uh, I think I would want to run myself over with the car. <laughs> like, no, actually, I think you don't have to understand the entire Fast and Furious franchise to go see Hobbs and Shaw. In fact, you don't have, you don't have to have seen, to even understand them as characters. And this is not dissimilar, as many of you know. You're like, well, I don't, I don't connect, I don't know this Fast and Furious thing of which you speak. Whatever you're into, typically, especially in the 21st century now, it seems like everything has gone this direction. Avengers and all of their solo films and then the films where they come together. Maybe you have to watch them, maybe you don't. Maybe you have to watch them in a certain order, maybe you don't. Star Wars, all out of order. Does Rogue One come before Episode 4 and why was Episode 4 first, right? <laughs> I know, Harry Potter has Fantastic Beasts. When's that all taking place? Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, which comes first? but the one came after, right? Now, what does this have to do with anything in our text today? Well, <laughs> in Ezra, we've been looking at the people of God. They've been under oppression and exile for years. So you're not coming into episode one. In fact, Babylon invaded and destroyed the people of Israel. They'd already had their you know, Moses moments. They'd already had you know, built a nation, King David, Solomon, all of these pieces. And then it all comes crumbling down and so we're in episode, you know, at episode 17, or whatever we might, we might want to say. Israel was disobedient. God allowed Babylon to wreck them, take them into exile for 70 years. But a guy named Daniel spent some time in that lion's den. He prophesied that Babylon, who'd broken down Israel and carried off her treasures, would also then get broken down, which happened. Persia broke them down. And then as we saw at the beginning of Ezra, Cyrus the Great says, all right, guess what? I'm a more benevolent king. I love your God, seems great. Of course, he loves all the gods. He's just sort of that thumbs up politician king. And he's like, go back, you're free to rebuild your temple, renew your worship. And that's what we've been following over a number of chapters. Altar worship, they began putting their rebuilding, the foundation got laid, then local conspirators riled people up and stopped it for 17 years. And so then Darius sends them a decree, giving them a thumbs up again. The temple's built, dedicated. We still talked about how they celebrated Passover. So we're working on about 90 years here. And if you remember, so we've been following this story in Ezra, but then there's this passing mention that they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah, right? So Haggai and Zechariah have this whole side story. You can read their two books of the Old Testament, and Ben gave us some excerpts from them. Now, you don't have to read those spinoffs to understand what's going on in Ezra, but it's helpful if you have the entirety of the franchise and realize where things plug in, right? You don't have to have read Ezra and Nehemiah to understand even, conversely, Haggai and Zechariah. But they are important, and some of those connecting tissues absolutely matter. So now they're working on Fast and Furious 9, which I believe actually is rumored now to be in space. Um, 
but also, the, but also Hobbs and Shaw won't be in Fast and Furious 9, but they are characters that intersect. Elements from their movie may have ripple implications in the main series that you're reading. So again, why am I telling you this? Because today, without even seeing their names in the text, we're gonna see how the side story, Esther and Mordecai, factors in, and what's happening in their spin-off in the Old Testament has an impact on our main character, Ezra, and what's going on. Who, by the way, the book's called Ezra, and this is the first chapter, chapter seven, where he even shows up. This is the Ezra and the Furious as we get into things today. But what we'll understand as we read and then talk a little bit more how and why, I mean, how, how and why I'm making this illustration. But let's dive into our text and read the entirety of chapter 7. I'll pray. Father, thank you for your word. And give us again that hunger, not just to read it, but to understand it and apply it. Give us the heart of Ezra that we see today in your name. Amen. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzi, son of Buki, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked. For the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in the matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Quote, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, Peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and the gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia. And with the free will offerings of the people and of the priests, vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then, you shall, with all diligence, buy bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do, according to the will of your God. The vessels that have given you, we've given you for the service of the house of your God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes the king, make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, requires of you, let it be done with all diligence. Up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven. Lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, Appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God. And those who do not know them, you shall teach. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king, to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me, aha, do you notice the person change there? Extended to me his steadfast love 
before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we come into chapter 7, and if you do the math, and you've watched the story so far, I mean, we've, we had 70 years of exile, then 17 years delay in getting the temple built, and now it's actually, now we take another jump, and it's 57 years later. And so we've got this, now we finally have Ezra, titular character of the book, although some of you might remember, I mean, Ezra and Nehemiah used, were originally one book. So we've been following Zerubbabel and some other characters, then Ezra in the center, and then Nehemiah comes in later. But as we see in a little first-person writing, who do we think wrote this book? Ezra. Right. He switches to me. When it comes to all that he's been describing other people in third person, and now it's like me and I. It's like, oh, I wonder who wrote Ezra. Ezra. But this chapter features then, very prominently, and almost for some of you, you're like, yeah, and a little redundantly, like you've got this letter from Artaxerxes. And so some, some people at face reading, you might be like, ooh, a letter, big wake. Why is this a big deal? Why is this featured prominently, this letter from King Artaxerxes? Why include this letter? Well, if you do a little study of your word and, and the composition of what's going on and all the different connecting pieces, right? You jump over to the spinoff, Haggai and Zechariah, and how it fits in. And you realize, wait, there's something else happening with Persia and the king right around this time. As one commentator put it, the measure which this document authorized and the remarkable interest the Jews displayed in it were probably most owing to the influence of Esther, who's thought to have been raised to the high position of queen a few months previous to the departure of Ezra. Now, so while this is going on and he's getting this favorable sending out, we actually have this story of Esther going on. Now, to be fair, some of you, the, the theologians in the room, like, wait a minute, I actually heard it was the, the king prior and that this king just has a similar name. Yet there's a little historical dispute. But whether it was the influence of Esther right as Ezra is being sent out or the fact that we just had Esther as the king with the prior king, the favorable disposition toward the Jews is invariably due to this goings-on back in Persia. Now, for those of you who might not know the story of Esther, quick synopsis. The king is, you know, that, that, this great king that we love in some ways, he's drunk at a festival, and orders this queen Vashti to appear before him to display her beauty to all of his guests, and when she refuses to actually show up, he deposes her and seeks a new queen and holds kind of a beauty pageant. And Esther, an orphan daughter of a Benjamite under the protection of a man named Mordecai, gets chosen. Now, later in the story, then Mordecai, it won't bow to Haman, one of the leading king's advisors. And so Haman requests, oh, he wouldn't bow to me? Well, then all Jews in Persia must die. This guy kind of invented the word overkill, literally. So, and so when Esther learns of this, Mordecai tells her, you know, go to the king. And there's this ordeal. Right? Well, if I go before the king without being summoned, he could actually have me put to death. So she, Mordecai urges her to try to have faith. And so she goes to the king. She risks her life. And the king welcomes her, says she'll give her anything she wants. But instead of being directly playing things out, just being, you know, Haman's head on a platter, like, she's like, why don't we have a dinner? And Haman's invited to the banquet. And the king again asks Esther, is there anything that I can give you? And she asks the king to spare her life and that of all the Jews. And the king like, the king's like, well, who's threatening them? They're like, well, this guy. And Haman then throws himself at her feet, actually trying to, you know, act like trying to, uh, throw, you know, oh, no, please, don't, don't throw me under the bus here. The king thinks he's attacking her. So he doesn't end well. All of his possessions, in fact, go to Esther. Esther tells the king about Mordecai's role in her life, and then Mordecai winds up becoming, guess what? King's highest advisor. So we have this Persian disposition toward Israel that is influenced by Esther, by Mordecai. These Jewish influences have made the king very favorable for a variety of reasons. And so whether it's this king or the next king, there's that general peaceful disposition. And that's why I want, and that's if you're, if you're following along with the sermon notes and you're a fill-in-the-blank kind of person, this, right, here, here we go. So, right, this, the interlocking books of the Old Testament, it's important to understand how they interconnect. Because they help us actually see, not just so we know the story, right? Not just so, well, I know the franchise, I know Rogue One comes for episode four, blah, blah, blah. Like, not just knowing, not just knowledge, but it helps us actually appreciate the bigger picture of a verse that is often quoted, Romans 8, 28. Some of you know it by heart. And we know that for those 
who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This, this is a verse of great comfort to us many times, but it's not just a nice sentiment for us to think about when, when tough times are around. All things work together for good for those who are called according to God's purpose. This actually helps us understand that it is a historical reality, not just a beautiful sentiment when we're feeling weary. It's like playing pool, and you're trying to get the geometry angle, and all the different balls ricochet and hit different balls, and like things are happening and moving, and we, you're looking at the direct consequence. You don't understand all the ways that things are being impacted and rippling and changing. Right? We can read Esther and we'd be like, oh, it's almost like a, a Cinderella kind of story. And she goes before the king and she rags to riches kind of thing. And the king has picked me to be his queen. But it's happening to help Ezra. Mordecai doesn't bow. Ultimately, that's working out to lead to a favorable disposition toward this letter. But it looked pretty scary for Mordecai at the time. Esther risking her life in Persia has major ripple implications for Israel. We don't know at what time our own major, where, where our Isolated actions, that's how we think of them a lot, right? I'm in my house, I'm doing my own thing. What are my isolated actions going to have ripple impact on that I can't even fathom in the geometry of the way God is working out all things in the world? All for good. Now, this can either change my disposition one way or the other. That doesn't mean I have less responsibility. Well, all he's going to work it all out for good, so I guess I'll do whatever I want. Like, no, how am I going to be used in that scenario? Am I going to be used in light of my actions or in spite of my actions? Is he going to use James's screw up to do something to help somebody else? Or is he going to use James's faithful walk to actually have ripple implications that I can't even fathom? And so here we have this example of the man Ezra used by God above. Ezra is the shortened form of Azariah, which means Yahweh has helped. If your life is going to have ripple implications and you're going to be an instrument, that's kind of the tagline you'd like, right? I'd like my name and my life to be a way through which Yahweh has helped. Yahweh has helped despite me is kind of, I mean, he will do it. That's not necessarily the way I want it to be. Because we see, then we have this, we have his lineage. And again, some people are just like, oh, it's another genealogy. This is my favorite part of the text. Now, some of you actually, again, now the, the neat nicks in the room is like, wait a minute. If you do the math of generations or even look at some other genealogies, this, this isn't a direct, this goes back to Aaron, but aren't there some skips? Yes, there are. Just a side note, this genealogy is incomplete. It gives no more than 16 generations between Ezra and Aaron, whereas the number of generations between Zerubbabel and Nishan were 26. And you're like, so some of you are like, this is where some people are going to run into critique sometimes. Some of you are asked to give a reasonable defense of your faith because somebody's like, see, Scripture's contradictory. There's names missing here. Is it inaccurate? No. Curtailing or shortening genealogies and omission of names is common practice amongst the Jews. Like, in fact, you call yourself a son of Abraham when you were like 16 generations later. Is that wrong? You're not a son of Abraham. You're like a great, great. You have to say great, 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 great every single time. No, you, you say you're a son of, but it's fine. I'm a son of Jim Harlan. That was my grandpa. Technically, I'm a son of Jerry. But I could tell somebody I'm, a son, I'm an offspring is what you're talking about. So sometimes we just get the highlight genealogy jumps. Sometimes we get the full meal deal. In fact, if you go over to 1 Chronicles 6, 7 through 10, we actually see some names used that are omitted here. I guess he wrote Chronicles, Ezra. So we'll get into that later. So it's like he knows what he's doing. We're all, you know, it's not wrong to skip a few names. If you're, just, if you're name dropping things to connect you back to the fact that he is in the direct line of the priesthood, right? And that's where something we've seen God build the, he's brought the people back, he's had the temple built, we've even seen Passover celebrated. God's people have had all the pieces to worship their God in the way that he has asked them to since he built a people from Abraham to Moses and then gave them the law. But God's people had all the pieces to worship God, but he still had to provide an acceptable priest. Right? Ezra was a direct descendant of Aaron, brother of Moses. Right? That gives you, that's a very special lineage. And so God appoints and provides them the priest that they're going to have, the mediator, the one who mediates between God and man. There's an important portrait being painted here, and we'll come back to that. It says he was well-versed in the law in the Old Testament, right? He was a teacher by trade. It talks about him teaching quite a bit. And then, in fact, he's directed to teach. That he might put honor on the priesthood, the glory of which had been eclipsed by the captivity. 
It says he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. The king granted him all that he asked. Why? For the hand of the Lord God was on him. And then it says later again, for the good hand of his God was on him. And I don't want us to miss this. Right? I think we discussed this a few weeks ago. Yes, we're saved by grace, not by our works. But how then we walk is absolutely important to our God. Not in meriting our salvation, but in being an imitator of God as beloved children. And so he said, why is the hand of God in his temporal existence on Ezra? What is correspondent to that that is directly told? It says, Ezra, we, we understand, he seeks to understand God's word. And he seeks to understand it, not just for knowledge. That says he, he understood the statutes of God. He practiced, he would then do it. And then it talks about how he would teach it. Right, the order of things in the verse is very observable. Some commentators, a lot, all the commentators point this out. There's one thing on Ezra 7. This is where everybody spends a bulk of their time in all the books you might read on the side. The order of things is very observable. He endeavors to understand, not for curiosity or ostentation, but in order to practice. And next, he consciously practices what he did understand, which made his doctrine then even more effective. And then he earnestly desires and labor, labors to instruct others that they might also know and do it. That's my question for us this morning. Do we have an Ezra-style disposition? Do we have his heart? Hey, do we have the disposition of Ezra? And if not, should we start asking God to help us have it? At first, it means we want to know things. Then, I want to diligently put them into practice. Then, I want to understand it enough to be able to communicate it to others. Like, like our children's leaders are doing in the back room with the kids right now, right? You know, last night, I oh, sorry, Friday night, uh, my wife got to do the uh, national anthem opening at the Aqua Sox game up in Everett. It also just so happened, coincidentally, there was Star Wars night. <laughs> she was dressed as Leia in her Endor outfit, for those who are specific. Right? And between the innings of the game, there were actually performers that would come out from the 501st Legion, sort of a Star Wars group. They'd be, they were dressed in Star Wars garb that was authentic down to the stitching seams and serial numbers. All right, they had mock lightsaber battles. I could use a little better choreography, but... Right, but those suits were good down to every detail. And these folks, I guarantee you, know everything about Star Wars. I mean, they were handing out Funko Pops of characters that even I didn't know who they were. So, like, it's, like I haven't even heard of these characters. So you've got to really be into Star Wars to know these details. But they were in it enough to have their costumes down perfectly, to practice, to, to practice and know lightsaber moves. They, they could imitate everything about it. And in fact, then, as you saw, all the little kids in the cheering, yay, they were inspiring kids to some imitation. Right? In order to teach others to pick up a plastic lightsaber and do the same thing in this case, right? Understand it, practice it, and it teaches or it preaches. See, we do this with things we value, don't we? Now, some of you are like, no, I'm not a nerd, right? But the game was sold out. Why was the game sold out? Because Felix Hernandez was pitching. People understood who he was. He's a mariner, so he was going to be there. So now they're spending their money, their time, their treasure, giving up their time, bringing their kids. They probably know his stats, right? If we understand, we participate and go, and we induct our kids into the things that we value. It doesn't have to be a movie franchise. Right? It doesn't have to be. It could, it could be you know, Marvel, Harry Potter, Fast and Furious. It could be Seahawks. It could be motorcycles. It could be mixed martial arts, right? The question is, do we have, we have the disposition of Ezra in some of those places, but do we have the disposition of Ezra in regards to the story of God? Should we? Should we have this disposition toward the story of God? I think it's implicit and explicit. I think it is uh, both descriptive in Ezra and prescriptive in our New Testament that we should have this heart. We, I want to understand it a little bit better each day. I want to put it into practice a little better each day. I want to teach and disciple others as God may bring them my way, right? That the good news of Jesus should reorient my attitude of time, my attitude of treasure, my attitude of talent. I mean, my goodness, we look at the pagan king's disposition. I mean, this guy's just giving lip service, right? And, but what is, what is his disposition recognizing it as something that those people value? Right? He's like, you're sent by the king, he says in verse 14. Carry the, take silver and gold. We'll even give you some to get you jump started. And then take free will offerings of the people. 
With this money then, with all diligence, buy your bulls and rams and lambs in verse 17, grain offerings, drink offerings, offer them on the altar. Verse 18, whatever seems good to you then to do with the rest of your silver and gold, I mean, well then do what you will. But I want you to think there a minute. What is the king? I think he recognizes it in the heart of Ezra and the people. So he's not telling them to do something they're not disposed to do. Though anytime you got a group of people, there's probably people in different stages of, of feeling. God, I bet some people you get loaded up with all that gold and silver and you're like, hmm, this could buy me a lot of cool toys, right? No, first, think about the order of our money. That's something else that his people have delved into. Okay, what, what can I take away from Ezra? We've seen it a couple times along this path in Ezra. And you don't know, we talk about it when it comes up, we talk about it when commentators come up. It does, this is actually another passage that should make us consider our heart of giving. Notice it's give to God first, then what's left, if, if there's leftover, figure out what to do with that as you will, according to the will of your God. You know, even the thing that's left over and sort of like do with it what you will, still is connected to think about what God would want you to do with it. Like what is our mental and practical order in regard to our giving when it comes to life. As I can't pretend that I'm somehow perfect in all of this, lecturing you as a pastor who's you know, so excellent that his giving is in perfect order every day. Right? But think about when it's payday, where does your heart go? But what are those first things you're thinking, okay, the money's coming in. What do I want to do with it? How do I want to dispense it? The two of the things of God first, and then like, is it about sacrifice? Is it about offering? And then what's left over? Like, or is it kind of the reverse? Like most of us, most days, it's like, yes, all right, vacation. I, and then, if they, well, I guess I have some left over for charitable works, right? I'll throw a bone to that, uh, that group I like. I'll throw a bone to my church. And right, how much of the work of God's people is actually on our mind first? How much can I use to help others? And then what is left for me? Like, do I have that mindset? I can't pretend to have it perfectly, but it seems to be the perfect mindset that God has called his people to. A heart of sacrifice. A heart for offering. And then, again, you've got to hear that, not of guilt. No, not of guilt or even emotion. I not just get stirred up by a passionate plea. I understand why that happens. Sometimes when you go to a, a charitable fundraiser, they get that special guy or gal to come up and they, they give the impassioned speech and you feel really bad for those kids or those animals or, or whatever it is. And the times when we actually have a heart for giving is just when we're swayed by our emotions. And when we look at the Old Testament, we see that people, I, 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 this needs to be planned. This needs to be intentional. This needs to be specific. It needs to be portioned. It needs to be a well thought out conversation dispensed regularly and faithfully and consistently. Now, certainly, I hope, it I hope it has my emotions. Kat and I give to a very strange uh, side, side project. We actually uh, sponsor a rat in Cambodia that sniffs out landmines. You know, I, 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 that's, I, I read how much land he's cleared and how many landmines he's uh, found and how much land's then been brought back to the Cambodian people. And it's, I jump for joy because I'm funding a rat and it's weird and cool. And it's, right, hopefully my emotions are engaged in my giving. But really, God calls us to a heart of thoughtful, intentional, planned life of giving. And that's why he organizes his people around that too. Right? Just the amount of thoughtful planning and giving of a couple of years that actually manifest in massive amounts of labor. Dawn told us yesterday for light fixtures was a gift of giving. Well thought out, planned, orchestrated, implemented. And here we see, I think when we look out at the landscape of the church entire in America, we see here the heart of a faithless king is more faithful in mind of what giving ought to be than many of us proclaiming it in Christendom today. And again, you know, this isn't prescribing your amounts, this isn't prescribing everything, but it is a call to steadfastness, dedication, and diligence. I know Catherine and I do, we sit down several times a year to discuss how, how, how is our giving? What does it look like to our church and beyond? What are those percentages? How much do we want to be giving? How much do we, would we like to be doing? What would it look like to change to get there? How are we going to give it? There's different ways to actually give money today. Online, plastic cards, cash, right? How and when are we going to change it if need be? Right? Here we see Ezra is God's capable instrument. And he's also being very, very faithful, not just in giving of 
time, treasure, and talent, but then, man, my goodness, he's credited, and it's generally understood outside of reading this scripture as we understand the fullness of what he's done historically and in, in tradition. We know, we know here the king tells him to appoint leaders and magistrates, which he does, institutes the great synagogue, establishes then synagogue worship and the systems there. It is generally believed he wrote Chronicles, Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah was originally you know, one chunk. And it's actually thought, it's presumed by most, that he wrote Esther. And at that time then, what was the canon of scripture? Ezra was really the definitive word and authority. That's was just generally res received tradition respecting Ezra. What, what an incredible honor. What an incredible amount of responsibility. And we actually get in to see what roles did he have then? What we know about Ezra, number one, he was a priest claiming descent from Aaron. We don't doubt then that he faithfully discharged the duties of the priesthood. And so he was a priest, which ties in, we'll close with that in a minute. But he was also a scribe, right? It says that he was a scribe. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach. And that meant he, was, he could be, would make copies. One of the most important duties back then, right? I couldn't just, they, you couldn't just hit print. We also see that he was an administrator and reformer. And he comes in and he actually reforms much of what is going, he reforms and restores. In fact, many times we talk about the Reformation. It's not so much reforming into something new, it's, reform, it's reforming back to restoring the way it ought to be. Set about the work of reforming abuses with a vigorous hand, as some commentators say. His ardor led to serviceable organization and reform. But he also seems to have been, as few strong-willed men are, a cooperator with others. He acts with Nehemiah, the governor, and it may well have been difficult to define you know, their duties and job descriptions. They didn't necessarily have a one sheet. So he not only had to be a strong reformer and a strong influencer, but also work well with others. And a man of influence with his fellows, which is, honestly, it's essential to leadership with God's people then and now. Right, the pastor is not to be an authoritarian. The pastor is to be a godly influencer moved by the Holy Spirit, co-laboring with elders and deacons and a congregation together. Get much more done through influence than just by order barking. And there was that about Ezra. Men who, like Ezra, earnestly seek the will of God and do what they know to be right and lay themselves out for doing good and communicating, as Hebrews 13 says, are likely to have power with men. Power in the best possible way. Power that hopefully does not corrupt. Absolutely, right? Because most of all, then number six, he sought to be what? This is what governed everything else. An instrument of God. Or as, or as old commentators say, and I love this flavor, a man through whom God wrought. The hand of the Lord his God was upon him, right? Verse six and verse nine. He, his soul felt the quickening touch of the divine finger, one commentator said, and it kindled with a sacred glow of piety and zeal, moved of God to attempt great things, helped of God then to achieve them. His life flowed like a fertilizing river and did so all his springs were in God, Psalm 87, 7. Right? It's not impossible that God could in our characters cultivate and bring these kinds of things out, is it? Our lives, we, we don't have to look at Ezra and say, woe is me, I kind of stink compared to Ezra. But what if I actually started praying to be an instrument of God? Maybe I'm not called to be, maybe I'm not called to be a priest, right? Maybe I'm just, uh, my handwriting's pretty bad, scribe might be out. It's like, how can I be an instrument of God? Either from a few things on that, can I be an influencer for God's kingdom? Absolutely. Might there be an area where I could be a reformer? Absolutely. Some of you know we sent Ben to our synod and there's struggles for reformation in our own denomination right now. Some of us can be good administrators, get light projects and gardens and all these things, right? But if we work back to number six, what might God be calling you to as his instrument? Because remember, if we listen to Ezra, we see three things I take away too. He recognizes when God is working through others for his good, right? He acknowledges. We see this in the way that he writes up this passage. He sees, and we know if he indeed wrote Esther, as is assumed, like he understood how God was playing out all of these stories for his good and the good of God's people, or how his story overlapped and influenced Haggai and Zechariah, all these pieces coming together, as Romans 8, 28 
would say it. He took not just great comfort, but great confidence in moving forward, right? Acknowledged God's steadfast love. He takes courage and he gathers others for the work of God. Right? That verse 27 and 28, maybe just close your eyes and, and hear. Try to, like, what, when he's writing this down and believing it, not just writing words, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that's in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors, before the, all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go with me. Right? This is a guy who knew his scripture. He knew the words of Joshua. Right? How can we have that kind of assurance? How can we have the assurance of Ezra? Ezra has set his heart to study the word of God, well, clue one, and to do it, clue two, and teach his statutes in Israel. Right? There's our keys. May we study the word of the Lord, believe it, receive it, and do it, and be ready to be disciple makers as he may give us opportunity, right? Joshua 1, 9, as Ezra would have fully known, says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. And don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen? I've had that, the kids' version of that from VBS stuck in my head for the last two weeks. Right? Just, like, just like how this story doesn't mention Esther and Mordecai, but yet Ezra would understand how this thing connected. God is doing things you don't even know right now or understand how they are impacting you for your good. You don't know. You don't know how God right now is orchestrating things in fact, the more you study just sociology and how many degrees of separation we are from different things, you actually can almost start to see. These things do ripple and impact you. But we don't fully understand why. We can't possibly see except in hindsight and appreciation and gratitude. But then there's the other half, right? You might be being used in, way, in ways, in a geometry of relationship, you can't even possibly imagine that's going to impact others. How does that change your own thoughts and walk and conduct and life and disposition? Right? God's with us. He's working through us. He's working around us. He's working in light of us. And God forbid, he work in spite of us. I know it. I've been used that way sometimes. But how do we want to be used? Do we want to be used like Ezra? Do we have that aspiration? I'd like to be used like Ezra. I, wouldn't, I mean, it's okay to be used like Artaxerxes, but he but didn't really have a relationship with God. He got used. Faithless, but played into playing a part. How about, faith, how about faithful and playing a part with full knowledge? Because, guys, that's, that's the relationship we desperately need to have if we're going to spend an eternity beyond this life with our Creator and our Redeemer, right? God's sending and serving through Ezra is really, ultimately, yet another glimpse, as so much of Scripture in the Old Testament is, of, Jesus, of God providing our ultimate priest, Jesus. Paul in Acts 17 says, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God sent Ezra to be an acceptable priest to his people in this time in history as a foreshadowing of his redemption. Same way years earlier, Ezra's forefather Abraham was given a lamb to sacrifice his only son. He was going to sacrifice his only son. God provided the lamb. So many elements of foreshadowing. God one day would provide the Lamb. God one day would provide His only begotten Son to be the acceptable priest and to be the mediator between man and God and the acceptable sacrifice dying on a cross for sin. And of course, all 2,000 years ago, we see in Acts 17, when some heard of the resurrection, some mocked, but others said, we'll hear you again. But some men joined Him and believed, and also some women. It's our hope that as we understand all the interlocking pieces of the Old Testament and how God's building toward the cross of Christ, building toward the ultimate sacrifice, building toward our acceptable priest and our mediator and the reconciler between God and man, that then whether we're on this side of the cross or we're on the side or back where Ezra was, we desire to be imitators of God. Amen? In a way, and I, I don't like to mix my post, pre- and post-Jesus terms, but in a way, Ezra was a Christian and didn't even know it. I'll explain. Right? He didn't know Christ, but he looked forward as he understood Scripture to God's provision and redemption and messianic fulfillment of promise. He desired to be an imitator of God. What does Christian mean? It means little, that means a little Christ. 
Jesus was God incarnate, perfect, and Christians then in the wake of that following Jesus were called little Christs, imitators of Jesus. Ezra didn't even know exactly how God would show up and deliver that ultimate priest in Jesus, but not even knowing it, he sought to be an imitator. So we can connect with Ezra. We can connect with his heart, even though we stand on vastly different time periods of history. We have a heart for God's interlocking and unfolding word. Ezra did, with all the scripture that had been written up to that point and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a few more. That won't happen. If I claim I did, then we're done here. But do we have the heart of Ezra? Do I want to understand God's word so that I can practice it, so that as occasion may be in different portion, parent, grandparent, friend, pastor, elder, deacon, who knows, there might be opportunities to disciple. That's our great commission. And do we have a heart of offering and sacrifice? Do we have that heart for when God blesses me? Well, how can I use that to bless others? And oh, and there's some left for me. Can I have a changed heart in regards to what I'm given and how I give? Because I've given my heart to Jesus who gave all it should inspire in me a different way of living. And I hope it begins to inspire us as it inspired, as God inspired Ezra, as God inspired him to write his word, as now his word continues to inspire us. I pray we can have that heart. We have an opportunity imminently, of course, to respond with some offering, a song, and any gifts that have been brought today. But I hope that we will contemplate as this king sends Ezra and he's got a lifelong mission actually then commissioned by God. What? What else do we have to offer as we walk out into our week? Something we can all contemplate individually. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can look at the heart of Ezra, that we can be inspired. God, I pray, as some of us in this room, myself included, myself guilty for much of my life, willing to be fascinated by statistics or fictional stories or, or whatever it is and be immersed in understanding how all the pieces of the thing I like interlock. God, I pray you would cultivate in our hearts a passion to first and foremost understand your great, cosmic, overwhelming, magnificent, yes, simple in the way we can say the Apostles' Creed and yet so complex in how it stretches across the scope of all human history that we would have the passion to continue growing in understanding of that, that we wouldn't be complacent. Not just so that we can practice it, so that as people ask questions, we have knowledge, and knowledge that then is shareable, and maybe turns an ear toward you. Maybe, as Paul heard in Acts 17, I'll hear you again about this, or I'll come to church to hear more about this. And you would instill in us and foster a heart of growth that then would inspire others to that first spark of growth, to that first seed taking root. And God, give us the love that we need for your good son, Jesus Christ, and the relationship then that keeps that motivating us, keeps us going in this life till we join you for all eternity in paradise. In your name, amen.